from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. As our panelists are being seated, let me say yeah. a few words about each of them. Carl Gershman is president of the National <coughs> Endowment for Democracy. Prior to <coughs> his, assuming his position with the endowment, Mr. Gershman was senior counselor to the United States representative to, to the United Nations, serving as the U.S. representative to the U.N.'s third committee that deals with human rights issues, and also as U.S. alternate representative to the U.N. Security Council. Jan Mahatchek is chair of the Board of Trustees of the Václav Havel Library in Prague, a journalist, musician, and political commentator. During the communist era, he was a member of the Czechoslovak de descent and was involved in the dissident publishing and underground music cultures. After the revolution, he founded the country's first independent media outlet. Mark Rosenberg is the president of Florida International University. A political scientist, Dr. Rosenberg is the first FIU faculty member to become the university's president. FIU is home to the Václav Havel Center for Human Rights and Diplomacy, dedicated to the study of human rights and its impact on democratic transitions. Jacques Rupnik is, prof is professor at Sciences Po in Paris. An accomplished scholar, Rupnik was born in Prague and served as an advisor to President Havel from 1990 to 1992. He's a member of the board of the Václav Havel Presidential Library in Prague. Finally, Jan Schweinar is Columbia University Professor of International Relations and Public Affairs and a former Czech presidential candidate. A Czech-born economist, he has published widely on issues of economic development and transition and on labor economics. He has served as advisor to governments and firms in advanced and emerging market economies. The conversation will be moderated by Martin Palouche, former permanent representative of the Czech Republic to the United Nations and former ambassador of the Czech Republic to the United States. Thank you, panel. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Secretary, Minister, dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to join others uh, to thank first uh, the Library of Congress uh, for uh, hosting uh, this, uh, what I would uh, think is a very important event, a part of our Václav Havel festivities almost whole week here in Washington. Uh, let me start uh, just uh, repeating what has been said so many times. What is very specific about Václav Havel is that he uh, had many roles. Playwright, essayist, dissident human rights activist, revolutionary reader, president, statement, and maybe many more. When I was yesterday, uh, participating in an event at the uh, Atlantic Council, uh, because what we are trying to do is to uh, see what the Václav Havel ideas are, how to keep this legacy alive, and eventually bring them back to action. I was thinking first, uh, what are ideas? If we are Platonists, we believe that they are eternal, unchanging, if we put unchanging eternal ideas into public space, they can turn into abstract banalities, uh, to general statements not saying enough to us. On the other side of the spectrum, uh, we have situational ideas, uh, something that is connected so much with one concrete situation that uh, it can be remembered, it can be forgotten, it's past what to do with <coughs> things right now. From uh, old philosophers, from Aristotle, we know that there are some ideas uh, that can be used or serve as the basis of science. Episteme, 
we know uh, that there are practical ideas that can lead to betterment of action and we need to combine and distinguish between these two elements. What uh, we are trying to do in this panel, I brought here and I uh, asked here to come people representing different institutions that might have their own very specific uh, answer uh, to this question. The common denominator is that all these institutions already have uh, express their commitment uh, to the Václav Havel legacy so that we are not going to speak in generalities but about concrete things. What is also important is, I would say, geographic distribution. Uh, it's certainly true that the center of uh, the preservation of Václav Havel legacy is in the Czech Republic in Prague where Václav Havel lived and worked. But uh, uh, we know that Václav Havel's uh, importance, impact, role certainly crossed the borders of the Czech Republic. So we have here a, a representative of a European institution, Jacques Rupnik, he lives in Paris. And obviously we are in the United States and the transatlantic dimension of uh, uh, the Václav Havel's activities is extremely important. So I'm very happy that I have here representatives of two major US universities. And uh, Karl Gerschmann, president of the National Endowment for Democracy. I'm sorry, Mark Rosenberg, president of FIU, and uh, Jan Schweinar, uh, uh, director of the uh, Economic Center at Columbia University. And we have here an institution that is uh, more action-oriented, uh, president of National Endowment for Democracy. So I asked uh, gentlemen uh, to give us, in the first round, five, six minutes, just to describe what their contribution might be. And then we can have uh, exchange or uh, interactive uh, communication. But let me to finish my opening remarks uh, with a, a quotation from a playwright uh, from Václav Havel's predecessor a long time ago. Because I think that this, what I'm going to read to you, might uh, uh, bring back uh, something from the nature of Václav Havel himself. This quotation is from Aeschylus, a Greek playwright or poet. And who is going to speak here is uh, Pelasgos, the king of Argos, who is exposed to a human rights situation in his play, The Suppliant Maidens. It's about uh, young girls coming to him asking for, asking for protection because uh, they are uh, uh, persecuted uh, uh, and they are in big danger. And King Pelasgos does not know what to do because uh, uh, he also is a political realist and knows that every action has consequences. So what he says? I cannot aid you without risk of scathe, nor scorn your prayers. Unmerciful it were. Perplexed, distraught, I stand and fear alike the twofold chance to do or not to do. A deep saving counsel here there needs, an eye that like a diver to the depth of dark perplexity can pass and see and is it unconfused? And I think that Václav Havel is exactly uh, such a diver into the depth, but a diver into the depth that can then bring his insights into actions. So let's start our conversation. And I have the order of speakers as it has been put together by uh, organizers. So the first on my list is Karl Gershman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Martin. <laughs> it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me, and thanks to the library. Uh, we saw a video of Václav Havel speaking in 2005, but he was here a second time in 2007. And on that occasion, um, we said that we'd like to arrange an event where we could present him with our Democracy Service Medal, and NDI also wanted to give its Harriman Award uh, to, to Havel. So he said, fine, uh, we can have an event, but only on the condition that we use the occasion to give 
visibility and support to dissidents from countries that don't have freedom. So the result that we had a forum that he called Dissidents and Freedom, we had it here at the library, um, and it was addressed by eight activists from Russia, China, Burma, Belarus, Cuba, Iran, and North Korea. And an Iranian exile who was present at the event said that this was how a real hero gracefully and discreetly gave his audience an invaluable lesson in humility and empathy. Uh, people ask questions about words before, so I just want to very briefly <coughs> summarize what Václav Havel said extemporaneously at the opening of this meeting. His words were brief but very memorable. He said that bringing dissidents together from so many different countries was extremely important. These are his words. Not just because it gave them the possibility of cooperation, but because he said it showed that they ha what they have in common. Their fight for liberties, for human rights, human dignity, human freedom, which transcended their cultural differences and also the political ideologies of their respective governments. He then said that what's important, that while it's important to support dissidents, there are two risks. The first he said is that democratic governments and embassies have no way of knowing who's a real leader and a future president and who is only some crazy, crazy man who likes drinks in the embassy. <laughs> Still, he said, it's necessary to support such people because to risk that you don't speak with the right person is much cheaper than the risks, for example, if you arrange the evasion. <laughs> and that such support is also more sensible for the future of freedom and democracy. The second risk, he said, is that dissidents might not be successful. And their stories, unlike his own, might not have the kind of happy ending that Americans like so much. <coughs> dissidents, he said, have no guarantees. They only have some precepts, some principles, some values. They know that it is necessary to speak the truth and to speak about values, even though we must accept that it will not bring in the near future some visible happy end. But in spite of it, he said at the end, I think it is very good and very important to like happy ends. Now there are several conclusions I draw from this, and the first is that Havel's universalism was real, not false, as has been claimed by a particular Czech official that I mentioned in an article earlier this week. <coughs> Havel was not trying to impose a Western world view on others, has been claimed, but he was recognizing their common humanity and the universal desire for human dignity and freedom. The second conclusion is that solidarity with people fighting for freedom is not only the right thing to do, but it's also less risky than the alternative which is giving up your belief in universal human <coughs> freedom. If you do so, if you regard human freedom as solely a Western value with no more legitimacy than the official ideologies of authoritarian governments and subordinated to the pursuit of narrow, short-term interests, you will lose your compass, you lose your humanity, and you will pay a price in your own freedom and security. And the third conclusion is that one should never give up hope. The road ahead may be very hard. There can be a lot of suffering and failure. But openings can come at the most unexpected times and places. The key thing is to hold on to your values, to sharpen your ideas, to speak the truth, and never to lose your sense of humor. And he had a wonderful, sometimes very self-deprecating sense of irony with which he could put serious challenges in perspective. His legacy may not be appreciated today by some people in Prague, but that too will pass, and we should not give up hope that this current story, like Havel's struggle as a dissident living in truth, will also have a happy end. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Carl. Uh, the second on my list is Jan Machacek, uh, Václav Havel Library, Prague. Hello. Uh, uh, I was asked also to uh, <clears throat> mention briefly what uh, uh, our institution in uh, Prague uh, does. So uh, we are an institution which is taking care of Havel's legacy as such. So uh, it's not like uh, presidential libraries in the US because Havel was not only a president, but he, he was also a, a human rights activist. He was a political prisoner. He was a playwright. Uh, he was an essayist. And uh, so we are taking care of all kinds of these legacies. We also have an archive. We are really a library. We are digitizing archive and constantly. And uh, we are also a lively cultural institution, which is a personal wish of Václav Havel, that it's, that it's a place where people lively interact with each other and uh, meet uh, regularly. So we have a culture program almost uh, every, uh, every day, every evening. Plus, we are organizing uh, mid-sized conferences and big conferences. We also do, uh, pr together with the Council of Europe, uh, uh, we provide uh, uh, Václav Havel's Human Rights uh, Award. And uh, obviously, our ambition is to grow more uh, important on European and international level. We also have a website which is uh, also uh, possible to uh, check out and uh, you will find an information about us in English. So uh, now a little bit more about Havel's uh, legacy, what I consider important uh, these days, not only in Czech Republic, but especially in Czech Republic and Europe. First, I would like to emphasize that uh, Havel was an extremely decent and polite man, and he spoke extremely decent and polite uh, language. And uh, if he, uh, which is something which is about to extinguish in Czech politics, if he uh, had a chance to witness the language our current president is uh, speaking these days, it's quite uh, very, uh, very contrasting. Havel also. It was part of his uh, sort of uh, humbleness that he would never say like this is like that, this is like that. He would always say that I think, I guess, I suppose this is my opinion according to myself or something. So he would never be like uh, insisting too much and it was a very important part of his beha behavior and, and the language. He was always protesting the emptiness of the language but those who would think that he was protesting sort of empty language of communist regime or normalization so uh, are mistaken because he would be equally protesting against the empty political language of uh, these days, uh, which is unfortunately still prevailing in politics, but not only in politics, <coughs> everywhere in public life and also in uh, corporation, corporations very often. So uh, he... Uh, it was definitely a part of the normalization in, uh, in Czechoslovakia that people would say one thing and go around the corner and say something different, but this is still also prevailing, so he, Havel would definitely be critical of this, uh, of this uh, behavior, which is still unfortunately somehow deeply rooted uh, in the society, and he would always emphasize the integrity and the fact that you have to sort of be a guarantor of your own uh, uh, opinions and of your own language. It was already mentioned here that Havel was a uh, very humorous person, not, uh, not only a writer, but he, I would, that was a very Im important combination of humor and self-irony in his personality. It sometimes felt that he had one more level of reflection than normal people uh, do. This is symbolized by by his uh, famous quote, uh, which uh, he said, like, being in power, I am suspicious to myself. <laughs> <clears throat> the core topic of Havel, which is absolutely important these days, is identity, which is very crucial to Europe. And he, Havel was a great European, which, uh, which is a part of his legacy we are taking care of in library also. And it's a very important part of his legacy. <clears throat> and uh, he, wrote speeches 
about European identity and about combinations of identities and layers of identities at the beginning of the 90s, where nobody, nobody took care uh, of uh, these things. But whereas these days where we are witnessing a crisis of European integration and crisis of European project, everyone who deeply analyzes it ends up is a question of identity and how national identities could be combined with a European identity. But for Havel, it was a topic even before the revolution, and it was a hot topic of his speeches, which nobody or very few people understood at the time in the beginning of the 90s. So this should be emphasized. Identity is absolutely a crucial uh, topic of Havel. When I said that he was a big European, he, this is also a very urgent matter these days that he always emphasized that it's not the sense of life for Europe to speak about GDP, about economics, only that Europe has to have a core values, it has to have its mission, it has to, uh, uh, has, uh, it has to go somewhere, it has to have some leadership, it has to <coughs> have a vision. So this is also a very important part of Havel's uh, legacy. He would, uh, these days facing the crisis uh, in, uh, in uh, east of Europe and Russian aggression, he would definitely emphasize that being an ally, it's, uh, it, that means something very important and it must be taken seriously, both in NATO and both in Europe, because if Europe approves uh, sanctions, if European Union approves sanctions and we are part of the European Union, there is no way that we would approve the sanctions and then come back and speak to the domestic audience and be very doubtful and hesitant and even like saying that sanctions are uh, stupid. So he would uh, definitely say very loudly that this is absolutely unacceptable, unacceptable uh, behavior. <clears throat> very important part of Havel's uh, legacy is definitely a solidarity and uh, solidarity with uh, people who live in unfree uh, conditions anywhere in the globe, but uh, also he would be very ca careful not to forget, for instance, these days everyone obviously speaks about uh, Russia, about Ukraine, which, is, which uh, makes uh, sense, but Havel would be very careful not to forget these days about dissidents in countries like Azerbaijan, in countries like Kazakhstan, in countries like Belarus, in semi-authoritarian uh, regimes who are somehow considered behaving okay because they are not aggressive uh, to its neighbors, but uh, it's not enough not to be aggressive uh, to its neighbors and it's very important to take care of people who are persecuted in these countries and Havel would be very careful not to forget about them. So I think this is enough for the beginning. Thank you, Jan. And now, Mark Rosenberg, President of the Florida International University. Thank you, Ambassador. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're very proud to be a part of this, uh, this gathering. To understand us as a university is to understand that we very much align with the values and the behavior of Václav Havel. FIU is a public university. We were founded in 1972, opened in 1972, with a record enrollment then of 5,700 students uh, in Miami. Today we have 54,000 students. We're the country's largest majority minority university. Who we are is a function of our geography and our demography, and we're very, very proud of that. We see ourselves as a solution center for our region, not just understood, as South Florida, but the entire Caribbean basin and indeed uh, the hemisphere. And in the best tradition of Oslav Havel, we take responsibility for ch the challenges of our times. We are not a group of people who are in a fetal position waiting for the next budget acts to drop. We understand our mission. We understand the hope and opportunity that, that our students bring to us every day and we take responsibility in the same way that Václav Havel urged us at both an individual and collective level to take responsibility. We're ranked nas internationally as one of the, the top 100 
universities under 50 years old. We rank very highly in the social mobility index and in the Washington Monthly. 85% of our students work. They organize their studies around their work, unlike so many of us who perhaps came from a more privileged uh, circumstance. We're blessed to have the largest school of international and public affairs uh, in the world, about 9,000 students, uh, over 300 faculty, and it is there that our Václav Havel uh, Institute uh, is based. We, as many of you know, because you know Miami, uh, we have a, a large immigrant population. We have the largest percentage of foreign-born residents in the United States. And this puts us squarely uh, in the public debate about democracy, about migration, about assimilation, about income inequality, about the health disparities that accompany uh, new arrivals and, uh, and, and, and areas that have been disproportionately affected by the rapid process of globalization. And in that, we've had a longstanding commitment to democratic initiatives, to the rule of law, to the administration of justice. FIUs work shoulder to shoulder uh, with the Agency for International Development for better than three decades in terms of trying to ensure the rule of law uh, in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. We have a, a large Latin American program, as one could imagine. We also have a large Cuban and Cuban American studies program. We see ourselves at the university as a vital link between a theory and practice. And that's why we're really proud of the fact that, that Ambassador Palouse is a member uh, of our faculty. So what about Havel? Havel uh, visited FIU in 2002 in his last official trip uh, to the United States. This was organized by Ambassador Palouse. His address covered human, the human rights situation in Cuba, it covered the issue of international solidarity uh, with Cuban dissidents, human rights policy of post-communist uh, Central Europe, and his visit in many respects laid the foundation for ongoing, the ongoing connection between uh, FIU and the legacy of Havel. And what's really interesting here is that what you see is the triangulation of Havel, uh, our, our community, particularly our Cuban community, uh, and the university. And in fact, the Havel Center wouldn't be uh, what it is today were it not the direct support of individuals from our Cuban American community who understand the lessons uh, very directly that Václav Havel uh, uh, brought and still brings to the critical issues that we face in particular uh, in South Florida as they relate to foreign policy. I'm also proud of the fact that I believe that we were one of the first institutions of higher learning to offer to the then Ambassador Madeleine Albright an honorary degree recognizing her unique role uh, in American foreign policy and, and believing that she would have an even a greater role to play subsequently. And we're very proud uh, representing the faculty to have awarded uh, uh, the secretary uh, an honorary degree. The, 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 Havel, the Havel mission at FIU essentially draws its inspiration from the central message of his seminal essay, Power of the Powerless, in that uh, individuals have the intellectual responsibility and the power to confront totalitarianism and affect change. And as I was listening to the conversation uh, last night, about the issue of complacency. Basically, what, 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 what we're about in the Havel Center is we're driving a stake in the ground uh, to ensure that our students, that our community is not complacent uh, in the face of, of, of the absence of human rights, in the face of, of autocracy. And, and the presence for us of the Havel uh, Institute uh, suggests that, that, that we focus on human rights, that we focus on the process of demo democratization and the transition to democracy, that we focus on actual transitions and the lessons that can be learned, and that we build partnerships in the area of international human rights and democracy, and that in the end we serve as a bridge uh, for the lessons that are to be learned. Currently, the Institute is, is, is preparing Miami uh, for a democratic transition in Cuba. Uh, with, a, with a grant from the Knight Foundation. We have a public affairs program uh, of lectures and discussions. Adam Mishnick uh, recently spoke at the university. And original scholarship 
uh, initiative that's un been underwritten by a member of our community, Eduardo Bangochea, with a distinguished, with a distinguished scholar in residence, uh, who's uh, Dr. Alexis Hardines. Now, ultimately, universities are communities of memory and hope. And we at FIU believe that, that Havel's legacy <coughs> is going to flourish in the Havel Center's commitment to take the lessons of his life and turn these, turn our green grocers, and I mean that in a respectful way, turn our green grocers into responsible citizens who are going to improve the world, who are going to place morality over the expediency of politics, and who, like Havel, are going to leave it better than they found it. Thank you. Mark, thank you very much for uh, this uh, unique opportunity, and we'll do our best to use it uh, uh, to mutual or general satisfaction. Now, Jacques Rupnik, Paris, France. Thank you, thank you, Martin. Great, great honor to be here. And uh, um, Martin, yesterday evening, sent us a list of about 16 questions <laughs> we should address. Uh, I, will, I will only take two of them to start with to show how disciplined I am. Uh, what lessons have we learned uh, from uh, Harvard's legacy in 1989 and how to transmit it? Uh, lessons, the first lesson, this is actually the anniversary, uh, the unpredictability of history. Unpredictability of history. Havel made a great speech at Sciences Po on the 20th anniversary. I think it's his last major political essay about the unpredictability of history. He says, there are all these people who thought they knew, they knew the laws of history, you know, the, 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 they understood history, etc. All the social science, the journalists, etc. Well, this is a great invitation to modesty to social scientists, academics, there are a few of us around, you know. No social scientist predicted it. Though, of course, they, they had no shortage of learned arguments to prove that this was inevitable <laughs> so, uh, 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 afterwards. Afterwards, of course. That's, that's, uh, so, invitation. Uh, unpredictability of history. And uh, he had a wonderful statement of saying, uh, there are all these people telling us, how come you were not prepared? How come you didn't have any ideas about how to organize a constitution, this and that and the other? And he said, well, you know, how, how could we? We didn't anticipate this change. And secondly, I'm always suspicious of people who are too prepared. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, that's, you know, one, one, one legacy we can leave. The unpredictability and not prepared in terms of you have, you have your little draft ready. No, but prepared intellectually in your conscience. And that, that's, uh, uh, that's, I think, the, the, the other thing, how to transmit, well, I wouldn't give any uh, uh, advice. Uh, the only one is don't turn him into an icon, a myth, you know, a statue you will admire. There will be a statue this afternoon. I understand the past. <laughs> but if you want to keep the legacy alive, especially for the young generation, for the students we are teaching, they were born after 1989. And therefore, you must make that legacy alive and relevant to them today. And uh, one way of doing that, and this is an initiative uh, 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 we started a year ago with the Václav Havel Library, Václav Havel Dialogues on Europe. And we were asked to give some concrete example of what we're doing. Well, this is, this is one. The idea is Europe is in crisis. I haven't, I think, revealed a secret, but even in this country, this may be of concern. We're facing a double crisis an internal crisis, a doubt about the project, but an external crisis, not only in the East with Ukraine, but in the South, very, very dangerous. I don't have to stress that. So this is an entirely new, an internal crisis and two external crises. This is a moment when you want to engage in a debate about Europe. And you can do it by uh, bringing in the Havel legacy. Read. The best way to keep the legacy alive, read Havel's essays on politics, on Europe. He was a very committed European. He considered himself a European federalist. I was with him in Paris. He delivered in 1999 wonderful speech calling for a European federation. Well, OK, we need some federalist papers. We need some thinkers uh, uh, to put the current predicament in perspective. And I'm always amazed traveling 
uh, uh, around how Havel's essays are read around the world today. In Beijing, they are read uh, in, in, in Egypt now, they are, they are read in, 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 uh, uh, at Harvard, <laughs> in Paris, my students, they have to read it. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All of them read it differently. And this is what is interesting. Each of them, you know, they look for clues to their situation. So that's my best uh, 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 advice, if I can, for how to keep Havel's legacy alive, is through these European dialogues that we have started. We started in Prague, Bruges, Berlin. We will continue next year against in Prague, Paris, Warsaw, Sarajevo. A trans-European debate, not just for governments, but for institutions and people involved uh, in civil society. You will not build, this is one of Havel's ideas as well, just as you won't have democracy without civil society, you won't build Europe just by technocratic arrangements between the countries. You will need a trans-European civil society, a European public space. So we modestly try to contribute that, have that network, use the websites, use the internet, and make Havel's legacy that way alive. Final word about Ukraine, I cannot, cannot help it. One way of illustration of that. Um, Havel gave a statement, I think it was after the Orange Revolution, where he was asked, you know, what, what do you think, what should be the future of, of, of Ukraine? He says, well, Ukraine is at the borderline between two civilizations. And it is not up to us to decide where Ukraine should go. But we should make everything possible if it does make the European choice to welcome. It. And secondly, it should always make sure that it is the Ukrainian's choice. And I think so th this, is, this is one way of keeping uh, uh, have a, in today's circumstances, keeping the European option open and make sure, or at least do everything we can that it is the Ukrainian's choice. Thank you, John. <laughs> and the last but certainly not least, Jan Schweder, Columbia University in New York. Thank you, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I uh, should uh, mention that I had the uh, honor and pleasure to uh, work with Václav Havel as his uh, external economic advisor for eight years. And uh, it was really um, um, totally gratifying for me and also revealing in many respects. For instance, when we started in 1994, uh, Václav Havel did not believe in a free market economy. Uh, came to me as a surprise, uh, but uh, you know, long discussions that we had indicated that he had very good reasons. I mean, the Czech economy at that point was going through major upheavals. Uh, the rule of law was not established. Uh, there were all sorts of fraudulent types of behavior going on. And it uh, obviously was a situation where one would ask whether, in fact, a uh, uh, Western-style market economy was uh, functioning and would be functioning in the Czech Republic. We had long discussions about it. He uh, had very good sense, uh, this kind of you know, natural intuition. <clears throat> and so he very quickly seized, and seized upon and understood uh, how, in fact, one needs to bring together uh, various aspects, not just economics, but economics being so important, driving so many things, but the legal aspect, the philosophical aspect, the social, social science aspect generally. And from that, in fact, we had a long, long series of conversations and discussions. And in parallel to that, uh, a number of us, uh, I joined Czech colleagues and Slovak colleagues in establishing a new institution, Center for Economic Research and Graduate Education, SEERS, as we call it in Prague under Charles University, together with the Economics Institute of the Academy of Sciences. And this became a new place that started educating a new generation of economists from all over the former Soviet bloc and southeastern uh, Europe, ex-Yugoslavia, Albania. Now there are hundreds of graduates with master's and PhD degrees working all over the world, many of them back in their countries or trying to work back in their countries. <coughs> It was a tremendous idea that Václav Havel supported uh, 
in the sense that uh, you can imagine as these people assume positions, if they uh, manage to assume positions of influence, be it ministers of finance, governors of central banks, and so on, and have the basic very Western education, including the ethical standard, which is taken for <coughs> granted, but which we stress very, very much, that this could have a domino, incredible positive domino effect. Uh, that institution, in fact, is functioning very well. A number of people here have been affiliated with it. Daniel Herman, actually, before becoming uh, director of the Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes, has been heading with me the practical, policy-oriented think tank part of it. Uh, Jack Stack, Greg Stapleton serve on the board of the foundation that tries to ensure that fast fiscally we are and financially able to continue. And Václav Havel himself gave us a uh, written permission to start raising funds for the Václav Havel chair in political economy, bringing together the politics and economics of it in the global context. This is connoting, in fact, his ideas that we heard about the uh, both individual but collective responsibility, that we need to think broader than that. So this encompassed, in fact, the entire former Soviet bloc and, as I said, southeastern Europe, now expanding further than that. Incidentally, if there are any of you who would like to donate for that chair, <coughs> or others who would like to donate, talk to me afterwards. Um, so this was, this was really, really very important, and it's an institution which is having major effects. Already the governor of the Czech National Bank, member of the board of the governing board there, people at senior positions in other places uh, in uh, the post-communist world are members of this fraternity and sorority, and a number of uh, American ambassadors who are here, Adrian Basora and others, uh, have been, in fact, it's become the tradition that American ambassadors are issuing the uh, degrees. Uh, this is an American-style program, and uh, <coughs> I'm very proud that that's happening. So uh, the uh, alumni, and through their position, I think, uh, you know, have incredible effect because they're propagating these very ideas, and Václav Havel visited and uh, has been fully aware, and some of the students, as well as the postdoctoral uh, fellows worked, in fact, in the office of uh, President Havel. So this became kind of an interlinked uh, endeavor, which I think will have major, major effects uh, going on into the future. And in fact, given the strong merit-based ethical standards that these people embody, I think this is one of the very efficient ways, one of many efficient ways, to thwart the threat of the propaganda that we've been hearing that's trying to uh, uh, propagate ideas which are totally alien to this kind of an approach. Now let me put on my other head, which is Columbia University. Columbia University has, uh, as a result of President Bollinger's major initiative, uh, launched a globalization, global initiative. My Center on Global Economic Governance is an integral part of it. And this is a strong link to Václav Havel. President Bollinger was president of the University of Michigan when we brought President Havel there for a honorary degree. He uh, and Václav Havel struck a very friendly and I think a close uh, relationship. Uh, president Havel then spent a semester at Columbia University, followed by the semester here in the Library of Congress. And so Columbia has had a uh, strong, strong affiliation with that. When I joined the faculty three years ago, We've continued working on it, and in fact, part of this uh, global initiative, which we are now, with which we are going through the world and really trying to bring together uh, the ideas which very much uh, coincide with those with Václav Havel, are a way for Colombia to try to make uh, available its intellectual resources and, of course, gain from those elsewhere. The students who come to Colombia come from all over. We had a generation of Czech and Slovak students now that have uh, graduated from there. And we do cooperate with other institutions such as Sian Spo, where Jacques Rupnik and I just uh, were part of a fascinating conference asking precisely sort of what is the future of Europe. And it was a political and economic uh, discourse that was uh, very much so. So let me end by saying I think it's the next generation uh, of people who are going to determine uh, the questions that we are here posing. And I'm pleased that uh, a couple of the institutions that I'm affiliated with are taking part of it. Uh, thank you, Jan. I only would like to remind you that you also 
participated in our program at Florida International University, uh, which I think was a very important Central European contribution to Cuban-centered uh, discussions about economic. I, I, yeah, I would say say a word, Mr. President, about that too. I, I think you ought to be congratulated on what you are achieving you. at FIU. Thank it's you. been a pleasure to be there and interact with your faculty you. and the friends of the university. And Martin yeah. Palos is certainly uh, stalwart. Uh, and uh, yeah, seeing you. Ambassador Craig Stapleton Reich uh, um, uh, facing to me, uh, Craig is among other. Um, um, uh, thinks uh, chairman of uh, the board of Václav Havel Library Foundation, which is uh, in the institu uh, institution that also needs to be uh, mentioned here in this overall presentation, uh, based in New York, uh, U.S. Uh, partner of Václav Havel Library in Prague, and hopefully in the future source also of important uh, additions to uh, the Václav Havel archives uh, and also um, uh, an institution being able to map the impact, presence and uh, future life of Václav Havel here uh, in the United uh, States. Um, uh, so, uh, questions? A question from the audience. Uh, what is Havel's legacy for the idea of Central Europe? What does Central Europe mean in the 21st century, if anything? Who wants to react? Jacques? Well, I can, I can start. Uh, Havel was very interesting in the way he tried to convert his dissident legacy into politics when, as soon as he came uh, as soon as he became president. The idea of the dissident legacy was <coughs> in the past, 56, 68, 1980, we were defeated separately. The dissidents created a network of cooperation built on the Central European idea of overcoming the divides that existed in Central Europe in the past. And he made a great speech in Poland in January 1990 at the Polish Sejm, where he said, we should basically uh, try to create a central European framework for cooperation that became the Visegrad, so-called the Visegrad group. That was a tr political translation of that. He also said there's something interesting. Uh, we shouldn't be coming to Europe as some sort of uh, impoverished cousins who ask for help only. We have also an experience of the struggle for democracy, and that can be of interest. And thinking about Europe, thinking about Europe, not just as an economic institution or as some uh, technocratic framework, but we thought of Europe as a civilization that was under threat. And that may be of relevance to Europe as well. So there was this idea that we have a central European experience, we can translate it into politics, and maybe this is something of relevance to Europe as a whole. Last footnote, uh, I must not be too long, is unfortunately that idea of Central European cooperation is not doing too great. And I will not reveal a great secret. When you look again back to Ukraine, you know, you have the Poles very determined in support for you change in Ukraine. You have the Hungarians who more or less turn a blind eye to Putin, and then you have Czechs and Slovaks who are somewhere in between the Visegrad, the Central European cooperation, unfortunately, does not pass the Ukrainian test. Jan, I think that you are also... Uh... Okay, so uh, I, would, I absolutely agree, but uh, I would also add that he was, Havel was very critical of this approach, which was uh, typical for some Czechs or some Czech politicians like Václav Klaus, like this sort of like going alone approach and lack of cooperation like that. We are like the best achievers and we have uh, the best economy and best industries and we shouldn't wait for Poles and we shouldn't wait for Slovaks. So there was this attitude of like going alone or being the first and he was always very critical of it and he uh, uh, to, and he, uh, he was predicting it, that it's going to have like, bad uh, consequences, which it finally did. So this is just this. Carl. You know, I think we're in a period of transformation today. Um, and you talked about it before with, uh, with Madeline and, uh, and John McCain. It's a, we don't know which way uh, things are going to go, but Ukraine 
clearly at least the people in Ukraine are making the choice to want to be part of Europe, and if they succeed, you know, I believe ultimately it's not out of the question that Russia will make that choice, and that's critical. So Central Europe is in the middle of this, and uh, Prague is in the middle of this. Uh, we've had programs since 1989, we call it cross-border work, where Central Europeans are reaching out further to the east to try to establish relationships, spread the values, uh, bring democracy. And there are a lot of initiatives underway today that, you know, that I think could be very critical as we look forward to this. There's the transformation aid program that the foreign ministry in the Czech Republic runs. There are orga organizations like People in Need and Forum 2000, which are Czech NGOs in the Havel tradition, which work with people beyond their borders. Uh, Forum 2000 has this annual meeting and it's thinking of bringing together, you know, donors and people from all over the world to discuss, you know, forms of cooperation uh, to, to encourage the European future for the whole region. And finally, you have the radios, uh, which are in Prague. This was a subject that Madeline and John just discussed, and I think it's critical that they stay there and that they have the full support of, you know, uh, not only uh, the Czech government, but also the American government. Uh, there's a bill in Congress to try to improve the way the radios function. I think that S Senator McCain referred to this indirectly, but it's really the purpose of the bill is to separate public diplomacy, which is Voice of America from surrogate broadcasting, which is Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and to put it under a, a structure that will be a better structure uh, for the governance and to make it more effective because the radios are not sure of their own identity. I think it's a very healthy thing. And I think you know, the, there's a real partnership there between the United States and the Czech Republic. And, in, and I think in spreading these values and taking advantage of the fact that Central Europe is central uh, to reach beyond Central Europe and to try to create a common democratic U Europe for the future of all of Eurasia. And the other thing yeah, just very briefly, I, I would just like to add the perspective that, in fact, if you go back to the 1990s, uh, people from all over Central Europe, Poland not accepted, uh, were telling us how important Václav Havel was for the whole region. That in fact he was the shining light, that he was in fact representing and demonstrating to the world what Central Europe was about, the potential, and etc. So I think that it's up to the countries in Central Europe to realize that potential, and uh, I would uh, agree that Poland is exemplary in this respect, and I think that it's really important for everybody else to form a strong coalition in the good sense of, of being, these are the dynamic countries, or they have the potential of being dynamic. They really can play a very important part, active part, in shaping what Europe will be about, and through that, the rest of the world. Okay, thank you. Do we have more questions? Yeah. We have a, a question about um, the legacy of uh, Havel and the, the role of intellectuals as politicians. Uh, what does Havel's performance in office as a politician tell us about intellectuals who enter politics? And the questioner also cites uh, President Obama as another example. Any opinion, gentlemen? <laughs> I, I, think, I think it's perfectly fine. I think it's perfectly fine for intellectuals and, and so on to, to join politics. I think that the judgment can go either way. I don't think that there is a predominant <laughs> evidence yeah, it's bad or good. John. <laughs> okay, the Czechs in the 20th century have produced two great intellectuals who became great presidents. That's not a small achievement, the philosopher king ID, and that would be dear to uh, Martin Palouch. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, that, uh, that, is, that is one, uh, uh, one way of looking at it. The other way, I suppose this would be a more, uh, uh, more critical way, is what is the legacy? You know, they were dis dissident intellectuals, they were the opposing, they were the mirror uh, uh, for the society to understand itself, and also a challenge to the powers that be. Once you are in power, many people felt that there was a loss. Havel was no longer, uh, 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 some people thought, oh my God, he might be lost for literature, but others felt he might be lost for the dissident voice. He was not quite that. He remained, if you read his speeches, while he remained in power, there are little essays that try to continue that to be that critical voice. Unfortunately, I think this, is, this would be the broader argument, the group of dissident intellectuals that came 
uh, to politics in 1989 were very quickly removed uh, from power uh, afterwards, not just in uh, Czechoslovakia, in Poland, elsewhere, etc. So Havel remains sort of the exception that proves the rule. They were there for the 1989 moment, but not after. Uh, uh, let me I just... Should, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Okay, please. Uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, uh, I want to say that uh, Havel sometimes is uh, considered, even like by foreigners who were witnessing the 90s in Prague, that he was obviously a successful playwright, successful dissident, very successful leader of revolution, but he wasn't to them uh, such a successful politician or a president because they, they were overemphasizing these like little uh, losses or failures here and there that perhaps he was he was definitely against the separation of Czechoslovakia he lost he was for more responsible perhaps gradual privatization he lost he lost to Klaus and Zeman here and there but big picture actually is that Havel was a very successful president and this is going to be remembered he he uh, set up a very responsibly uh, our most important institutions like Constitutional Court, which uh, distinguishes us from, I don't know if you look at Slovakia or Hungary, our Constitutional Court has a courage to decide against, against the government and president. It has its own institutional history <coughs> uh, and pride. And, uh, and so he set up a judicial system which is not certainly working very well, but it's certainly improving. He always took care very responsibly that there is a colorful representation in all these institutions, like different kind of opinions, different kinds of professional backgrounds, etc. So I think that he really, and he led the country into the EU and NATO, and uh, so, so the big picture is that Havel, like an intellectual, was enormously successful president, not only leader of revolution. Martin? You know, there's, there's actually a very important issue that is raised by this question, and that is, what is the relationship of people, civil society, protesters, the, um, the Velvet Revolution, to what happens afterwards? And we've just had a very important demonstration of this relationship in Ukraine, where a lot of the people in the Maidan um, realized that you know, politicians in Ukraine had been very, very corrupt, had a very bad name <clears throat> in politics, but that if they didn't take responsibility for governance, you know, the same thing would happen again that happened after the Orange Revolution in 2004 and that the revolution would fail. So in this latest election that took place just a few weeks ago on October the 26th, many key activists from the Maidan, some of them were, um, investigative journalists like Serhii Lyshenko, um, activists who were uh, intellectuals uh, in the opposition, made what was a, for them an extremely difficult decision to go into politics and to take responsibility for governance. It's going to be very, very tough. But if people who are in the streets protesting for freedom and democracy don't take the responsibility for governance, it's not going to happen. I mean, we saw what happened in Egypt, and they just couldn't take that step. And in that sense, I think, you know, Havel really is a model. He's unusual, but a lot of people are going to have to follow that model that you, you have to go, find a way uh, to go from being a dissident to taking responsibility for what happens after you succeed in getting rid of a lousy government. If I can myself step into this discussion for a moment, um, uh, Ernst Gellner, a uh, famous uh, uh, Czech-British sociologist, once wrote a piece uh, in which he tried to compare Masaryk and uh, Havel. Uh, there are many reasons to do that. Uh, the president uh, who founded the first Democratic Republic of Czechoslovakia after the First World War and Václav Havel, uh, who did the same thing in his own times. And Ernst Gellner wrote in a very, I would say, spicy way uh, about this observation, uh, that Masaryk was a professor. And he said that the First Republic had, uh, because of the Masaryk influence, some sort of professorial qualities. And then he comments on the uh, further evolution in the 20th century, and he said, and professors run out. 
uh, and so when Czechs uh, and Slovaks uh, got a chance uh, to be free again, and he said he had to, they had to be satisfied with a playwright. And uh, it seems to me that it is deeper uh, and uh, uh, something to think about uh, the difference and relationship between professors on the one side and playwrights. And my uh, feeling is that Václav Havel really remained a playwright uh, uh, throughout his life. And uh, this is an interesting uh, quality. This is a challenge for all the institutions being involved in Václav Havel legacy uh, to uh, participate in public discourse, being aware of this very, very special Václav Havel quality. Do we have more time and more questions? We'll take one more and uh, okay. conclude with this, uh, and, and perhaps we can ask all of the panelists to address sure. this last question. And the question is about um, tone and the tone of Havel's words. And uh, the questioner writes uh, about how Havel was friendly, humble, uh, encompassing, and yet today there seems to be much um, vitriolic, hostile, and negative um, tone. Uh, how can we help keep Havel's tone alive? Gentlemen, uh, whatever order you pick up, please take it. Please mark. Okay, so here's, my, here's what I'd like. I'd like to see a Grover Norquist who tells anybody that, who wants to fund a political campaign, particularly in this country, that, it could, that the funding can only be used for positive messaging as opposed to negative messaging. And you'd sign that and... Uh, You'd sign that and then you know, you'd hold the candidates to that because essentially what I see in our young people with all this negative messaging, it's, it's very, very difficult to, um, to point to people like Havel. And I think in our case, that's why we're enamored of Havel because there was this positive element of hope and the sense of possibility and the sense of the the, 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 you know, the, the ultimate uh, ends that could be reached would be noble. We don't get that much these days, and that is a very, very serious challenge. So I think it's a really good question. Mark, thank you. Who else wants to? So yeah. uh, I, <clears throat> I think I already like responded it, uh, at the beginning when I was speaking about how <laughs> language, but I think it's it's up to us, uh, like all intellectuals, journalists, <coughs> enlightened politicians, they all should emphasize that <coughs> the quality of the dialogue and the culture of the dialogue which Havel was uh, promoting, we are still living <coughs> in a legacy of uh, sort of communist kind of dialogue because it was uh, uh, dialogue of two enemies who are supposed to liquidate each other or kill each other as communists were <coughs> wanted to kill uh, class opponents and this and that. So uh, dialogue is about enriching each other and, uh, uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this is the uh, role of it. So it should be, it should be reminded by all critically uh, thinking uh, intellectuals in the public space what is the role of the dialogue and what was the uh, what was Havel's contribution uh, into it, the Thank political you. culture in this sense. <clears throat> Jean, you seem to be willing to say something? Well, uh, I always can say something, but... Uh, <laughs> 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 no, I think the, you know, the great thing when you, when you see Havel, the, his first speech, you know, that he's reading a text, you know, there were no teleprompters, no sound bites, no nothing. You know, so there it is. The, the, not only times have changed, but you have somebody who has introduced in the uh, uh, Czechoslovak, but I think in a broad, uh, an idea that the politician is not there to promote power uh, in uh, uh, the party sense, in a confrontational sense, but to speak about some of the principles that are shared by the whole polity. And the most important, of course, is uh, the moral principle. Why do I enter into politics? There's a sense of responsibility, and there is the ethical principle. That is my entry ticket, so to speak, into the politics, not the quest for power. Then you can discuss how you implement it, etc. But if you have somebody like that in power, 
that introduces the language of ethics into politics, who introduces the idea that democracy is not just party politics, but also civil society. And that, yes, we are a great country, but we are part of Europe. Uh, you introduce those notions into the public sphere. I think that's, a, that's the contribution we need, and that's a contribution we lack. And we don't need sound bites, you don't need the, the media performance, but uh, that language that remains with the country. Okay, so let's go. Let me go there. So, I, I would just add to it that I think, um, especially for the young people today, it's worth uh, uh, reading Havel at two levels, quickly and then slowly, uh, because I think that he appeals at both levels. And uh, in fact, uh, taken it together with the positive approach to things, uh, it matches very well the young generations who are the creative ones, the problem solvers, right? Because Havel is a problem solver, right? He goes mm -hmm. at it, mm -hmm. and as you read it more slowly, you see the ingenuity with how he is approaching things. It's very much the entrepreneurial spirit of, of the people. They try, they do it first superficially, and then quickly sort of go deeper after that and try to find solutions at a totally different level. But I think there is actually a connection between the way Havel was approaching things and the way that the most uh, dynamic, active, and uh, successful entrepreneurs of today are approaching things as well at their own level. Thank you. Carol? Well, I think, I think uh, the tone issue has a lot to do with humor. So uh, maybe let's conclude this wonderful panel with a Havel joke. Uh, in 1978, he, uh, he and a few other, three other Czech and Slovak dissidents went up to the top of a mountain at the border between the Czech, Czechoslovakia and Poland uh, to have a meeting. And, and Michnik was, uh, was there too. That's where Havel first met Michnik. And Havel was not much of a hiker. Uh, he was really an anti-hiker. <laughs> but he had a knapsack, and he had provisions in the knapsack, and he put a bottle of vodka in the, in the knapsack. So when they got up there, they finally met. This was a very important meeting of the dissidents for the first time. Havel pulled out the bottle of vodka, which had a label on it of a, the smiling face of a hunter. And Havel sort of poured the vodka, and he said, you know, if we can't have socialism with a human face, let's drink vodka with a human face. <laughs> I, think, um, I think that's a marvelous uh, uh, closing of our uh, second panel. Um, just uh, one more thing. Uh, I remember Václav Havel repeating it again and again, what is for him, uh, I would say, the essence of good politics. And he always says taste. Uh, it's a sense for proportions, uh, a sense for uh, being uh, moderate and still straightforward. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I think that we are having a wonderful time here in Washington. And now maybe the most important thing is going to come, which is the unveiling of Václav Havel best uh, within a couple of hours. Well, as we come to the end of this stimulating morning, I know that you join me in thanking all of our panelists this morning. And I now invite you directly upstairs for light refreshments in the beautiful John W. Kluge Center. I also invite you to view a small display of Hubble materials that are drawn from the Library of Congress collections. And those will be on view in the Woodrow Wilson Room, which is adjacent to the refreshments. That display includes books autographed by Havel as well as unique editions of his works. It's been prepared by the library's European reading room, to whom we are most grateful. There are staff at the entrance uh, to the auditorium who will guide you to both the exhibits and the refreshments. Thank you very much again for being here this morning. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.